kill structures. You fill them with concrete, and you must go down about 65 feet. Get through that softer clay at least to hard yeah. pad. Yeah. Oh, nice. And on our right, one of the grandest <laughs> examples of Art Deco, that jazz age angular streamlined style, came out of Paris back in 1925. The 1930 Chicago Merchandise Mart, largest structure in America prior to completion of the Pentagon. 4,600 windows, seven miles of hallways. They had to give that building its own zip code. It was commissioned for $32 million by the Marshall Field Department Store. They dreamed of a giant wholesale market. They woke up to the Great Depression instead. They had to let that building go. $13.5 million by 1945, Mr. Joseph P. Kennedy picked it up. Good thing, too. I think Joe Kennedy was a man of action. He always got Some things done. Man. Joe used to get you just what you needed. 96 acres of floor space, 4 million square feet. He brought in the perfect clients to utilize the building, the furniture design industry. Ladies and gentlemen, look around you. I welcome you to the beginning of Chicago. This is where everyone first settled in, where the East Branch, the confluence of the South Branch left, the North Branch right. Early 1800s, we'd be having a drink by now. Before Chicago was a city, they would build three taverns right down here, so we'd never go thirsty again. Where you see the somewhat Bauhaus Holiday Inn in the first of three, Wood Point Towers, residential with living going up. Rentals here, that would have been the Miller House Tavern, 1827. Ahead of you, the new River Point Office Complex and Riverwalk sits where the Wolf Point Tavern was in 1829. At the corner of Lake Street in those early days, you would have stumbled into Chicago's only hotel, the Sauganesh. That is Native American, Potawatomi, for Englishmen. Sauganesh was not run by the Englishman who was named for Billy Caldwell. It was run by Billy's best friend, the French Canadian, Creole fiddle player, Mark Robian. Known for saying, I fiddle like a devil. I keep a hotel like hell, yeah. <laughs> it was at that Sauganash Hotel. 13 electors took a vote to incorporate as a city. This happened in 1833. Thus, on March 4th, 1837, Chicago, place of the stinking onions, becomes Chicago, the city for a Now, we're looking towards the North Branch. Look around you. This is a working industrial river becoming residential right now. More people are moving into Chicago proper than are leaving it because they like the nightlife. A lot of them end up right here. Now when it's finished, Wolf Point Tower, we have three buildings ranging from 500 to 900 feet, but that will only take up 30% of that lot. The rest will be a public park because we are embracing the river like the second lake front. I want to give a shout out to San Antonio, Texas who is actually reclaiming their river downtown in the 1980s and spurred Chicago on to do our urban waterways design project in 1990. So the idea today is a combination of private and public space. If you build along the river, you're going to leave since 1999 park space along the river for the public as well. Now coming up on our left by 17 years on the river, still my favorite four pounders. These are called the River Cottages. By Harry Weeks, down the triangular skylights at schooner sails, portable windows like you find on a ship. I never saw any of the movies until last year. So uh -huh.
better. <laughs> was built in 1898. It was a refrigerated warehouse for 70 years. Before Harry Weiss, same architect that did those charming river cottages, turned it into condos. He had to defrost it for six months. And then cut open the walls and take out a thousand pounds of horse hair. They used horse hair for insulating the material. Now friends, we here at, Sh at Shoreline are totally hip into the new social media thing. I'm 60 years old. To me, hash is a great breakfast dish. We make it with potatoes and spices. But we have a hashtag. We'd love to see your live photos right now. If you would just do hashtag shoreline smiles, we'd love to see what you're seeing from the boat. Now a building which is getting a lot of attention is the newest on the river. That's the one that looks like an inverted pyramid on our right, 150 North Riverside. You'll notice it has a unique design because this is an air rights building. Porthole windows at the riverfront park at the below, um, this building, our rail, those are exhaust ports for the railroads. The railroads are heading into Union Station. This building goes beyond modernism, so new we don't even have an architectural style name for it, although Chicagoans have nicknamed it either the Tuning Fork or the Generous Martini. You can take your pick. Now, this lot has been underutilized for 80 years because it's very tiny. It's two acres, and you have to deal with the railroads on the west and the river on the east. But this developer saw the challenge and realized they could do a building inside of a park and expand as you go up and still give you an acre at the base. They do this by cantilevering or cutting in the top eight floors on either side. That way you're out of the way of the trains on the west, you're out of the way of the park on this oh, side. Okay. But if you cut away your outer walls in this building, what's holding it up? They're working on the same thing I'm trying to return to, a strong central core. It's the caissons, folks. In this case, the caisson supporting this building would drive it down 105 feet because that is where you will hit bedrock. And when they hit the bedrock, they drove them five feet deeper and then they bolted the, bed, the caissons to the option stone. What about the train? The train kept her rolling all night long and the train would then pass on the ground floor of a building with one of the highest clock towers on the planet, the Boeing Building, Perkins and Wilhelm, and Ralph Johnson architect. I would call it postmodern, leaning towards that early European modernist design. Original client for this building was a famous salt company from right here in Chicago, Wharton Salt. When it rains, it pours. And there's a reference to the salt company in the architecture. Look at the roof. See those little holes? That was done to look at the top of a salt, a, a shaker of salt, a reference to Wharton Salt Company. Now, this is an air rights project. In the 1800s, Chicago gave the railroads its prime riverfront land, making us the railroad hub of America. You could not take one train from New York to California. You had to change trains in Chicago and leave a little money behind. So, air rights means you buy the air, you build over top. Now, the train will continue and go right through the, the plaza on the right. This plaza coming up on the right is the Chicago Daily News building. This is Art Deco again. Oh. Now, 
in Art Deco. This is the early 1900s. Historically, Art Deco comes at the same time as the opening of King Tutankhamun's tomb. So the Egyptian style is all the rage. They evoke the spirit of the great Pyx, the great Sphinx of Egypt, if you can see it, with the two clock towers being the paws and the body actually being the back of the building. That was a popular thing you might do in Art Deco. Civic Opera building on the left is also Art Deco. I call that building a perfect marriage of pragmatism and art. Start with an opera house, surround yourself with corporate towers, and that way your opera company uh, always has revenue coming in. Also, Secret Chicago history. With 3,000 miles of railroads, Chicago is also the hobo capital of America when everybody hopped to the freight trains to build this country. And Madison Street we just passed under was the main stem. We used to call that neighborhood hobo -hemia. Hobos, hey. artists, and the Wobblies. The industrial workers of the world fighting for one big union founded here in 1905. And everybody got an education on West Madison Street at the Hobo College, where University of Chicago professors would offer the tramps and bindle stiffs and bones a lecture. You could even get a Hobo College diploma. Yes, I have a copy of Hobo. This was replaced in the 1920s by the Dill Pickle Club a round table discussion where you might meet the poet laureate of America, Carl Sandburg, the writer Judah Barnes, or the boxer Jack Johnson. Now, on our right, you can see the Amtrak and Metro trains. This is an air rights project called Gateway Center. And if you look at these four major buildings, the twin glass boxes here from the 1960s, the white building from the 70s, and the mirror building from the 80s, you see a textbook example of architecture changing over the decades. You basically go from the Miesian glass box approach, the international style of the 70s and the white building, to the postmodern 80s. But look across the plaza, friends. One of the last great rail terminals in America, right in there, that is Chicago's train station, Union hmm. Station. You know, if the weather turns nasty and cold later, not as pleasant as it is right now, you might want to do something inside. <laughs> and I would suggest Check out Union Station. It's one of the last really grand rail terminals in America. And if you want to get your kicks on Route 66 and Highway, the winds from Chicago to LA, that's Adams Street and Jackson Street. They're one-way streets. Is anyone going to the Art Institute on Michigan Avenue? If you visit the Art Institute, look around for a 66 roadside. But right now, look to your left, friends. Prepare yourself for the second tallest building in America, the 11th in the world today. It is the Willis formerly Sears Tower. Architect Bruce Graven from Bangladesh, first engineering partner for Skidmore Owens and Barrel, Dr. Fazler Khan. You may wave at the people on the sky deck on the 103rd floor, they can see you. It features a floor of glass, a glass floor. You enter it, you're 103 floors up, you are walking on air. If you have a fear of heights, you will be heaving in the air. Do not look down if heights make you nervous. In 2009, London-based insurance company, the Willis Group, took over about three floors of the 110-story Sears Tower, and they renamed the building the Willis Tower. Oddly enough, in Chicago, you pronounce the word Willis Sears. <laughs> Chicago is a city of neighborhoods, and out in the neighborhoods, I do not know a single Chicagoan who ever got used to the name change. 99% of the time, if you ask a Chicagoan, what is the name of your tallest building, you know what you're going to hear? Sears Tower. <laughs> so we will turn the boat around for a better form of opportunity later. I'll talk about it in more detail, but being a Chicagoan, we will slip in the boat. Sears Tower. On our right, Art Deco in style, Graham Anderson props in white, 1921, the former Chicago Central Post Office. Did anyone see the Batman movie, The Dark Knight? Bat Welcome to the Gotham City Bank that the Joker <laughs> was robbing in that opening scene that was filmed right here. The building takes up an entire city block, anchored by four multi-story towers. Why did we need such a gigantic building to handle the mail in 1921? <laughs> Maybe because the mail order catalog business had major players step right out of Chicago. Spiegel, Montgomery Ward, the catalog king in Sears and Roebuck. A lot of mail ruled down those halls. But even without those big mail order houses, Chicago would still build the world's largest post office. Why? Because we are Chicago, the great American city of exaggeration. 2.7 million square feet, the largest post office on earth in 1921, Bill But elevators can slow things down. I find waiting for elevators to feel like waiting for it to go. 
as our friend the playwright Beckett might say, you never know when they're going to show up. The post office abandoned this building in 1996. They built a new headquarters right on the other side of the bridge. The old building long abandoned, achieves landmark status. And after 20 years, something's finally happening. 601 West Companies of New York are committing $500 million into the renovation. They are making commercial office space. They're going to put a meadow, yes, an actual green meadow, in the park around the road. Um, they might get the lead certification, which reduces your carbon footprint. That's the leadership in energy environmental design. And that's one of the locations the city has been trying to entice Amazon.com to consider as their second headquarters. If you know the big online retailer of Amazon, example of postmodernism, which was a reaction to the modern movement in the late 60s, early 70s. People got tired of glass boxes, said enough with the abstract boxes, you give us a headache, we want to look like something again, we will reinterpret the past, but we won't give up modern materials to do it. So, this would be postmodern Art Deco. Look how Jan recapitulates, he repeats the Art Deco of the 30s, the pyramid roof, the dramatic setbacks, a sculpture element of the trading floor. But what are the materials? Not the glass, the aluminum, the steel. I mean, not the stone of the 30s, but the glass, the aluminum, the steel of the day. Now, another postmodern building is the building with an old-fashioned roof of green gables, 190 South LaSalle by Philip Johnson and John Berkey. Although Philip Johnson was an international style modernist for most of his life, that building makes him a postmodernist. That roof dates back to 1892, being a recreation of Burnham and Roots, Masonic Temple Building, one of the first sk skyscrapers in Chicago. So essentially what happened with the postmodernists is they began to say, you know, we want to bring back a little history. We don't want to be so cut and dry because the modernists had a very strict definition of architecture. A building was almost always a cube, a box. Your color of choice was black or white, nothing in between, no decoration whatsoever. The postmodernists lightened up a little bit. They thought color wasn't such a terrible thing, maybe a curve, decoration, maybe they were being ironic. I'll give you a modern metaphor. You might think of the postmodern architectural movement. They are the DJs of the architectural world. Because what do the postmodern architects do? They will sample the architectural styles of the past, recombining them into a mixtape of a modern building. Well, the pink tower in front of the Sears Tower is also postmodern. 311 South Wacker, Cohen, Pedersen, and Fox, 1990. At 961 feet, that was the world's tallest concrete three or four structure when it first went Thanks. up. <laughs> Most distinctive feature of the crown. It's a 10-story drum of glass with almost, uh, almost 2,000 fluorescent lamps in there. Later, when you see it illuminated against the dark and wonder Chicago American night, you will hear Chicagoans calling it the White Castle. A nickname it earned because it makes us long for sliders, White Castle hamburgers. For the uninitiated, that's a famous Midwestern restaurant with a similar neo-Gothic style. Now we come to the one and only Sears Tower on our right. The Sears Tower, the second tallest building in America, 11th of the world today. 1,451 feet. The antennas don't count. A council on tall building sees that as an add -on. Tallest building in the world for 22 years. Now the construction technique is called a multiple tube system. Think of the Sears Tower 
Chicago Windy City had nothing to do with the wind. It referred to our early politicians being like me, full of hot air. But it really is a windy city with 81 mile an hour winds you have to deal with. When I look at the Sears Tower and I think about the wind, it brings to mind the great Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, writing in the Tao Te King, can one learn to be flexible? Can you follow the way of nature, the Tao? Can you bend and still remain straight? And I think of my Sears Tower as following the Tao, for it can bend and remain straight. Tall buildings have what is known as a sway back, and that means that building, on an average day, can move six inches in any direction. But if we get a once in a lifetime, 100 mile an hour wind, the building is designed to sway three feet. Now this building, this 1970s building, never got a lot of talk on the tours, so they decided to put themselves on the map themselves on the map. This was nothing but a blank concrete wall until they decided the river becoming more popular, let's do a map of the river, and they put themselves on the map. That red dot is this very building. You are here. That's the North Branch where you oh. saw the river oh, cottage. So do you have your bearings? Where will we go? We'll be going right. That's the East Branch taking us back to Navy Pier. Let us gaze upon the sheer face of the Sears Tower once again. And can you imagine, my friends, that you are French? Your name is Alain Robert, but the world calls you Spider-Man. Alain Robert, I love him, he is the French scare devil. In August 1999, in two hours, like a monkey, he climbed on the roof of our Sears Tower. Following this was San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge, Paris's Eiffel Tower. Finally, he would dance on the roof of the tallest building in the universe today, that is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, by Chicago architect Adrian Smith, 2,717 feet. Just consider the mind of the building climber Alain Robert, how he sees the universe. What is architecture if it is not simply stated that the way that we interact with and define the space we live in? You or I look at the Sears Tower, we might say beauty, we might say function. The daredevil Robert says, aha, another obstacle to help me overcome my greatest fear of heights. This is why he climbs for 40 years. He's trying to get over the fear of heights still. Let me be clear. I do not condone anyone trying to climb a tall building, no. But like Mr. Robert, I do suggest seeing the universe with new eyes once in a while. I was taught to think in this manner by the influence of a man who always said universe while riding spaceship bird. He seemed to be a verb when he picked up a four-sided triangle. We call that a tetrahedron. He expanded that into the geodesic dome, like Montreal Expo 67 or Epcot Center. I speak of an architect, philosopher, inventor. The reason that in chemistry, one of the versions of carbon-60 molecule today is called Buckminster Fullerene in honor of Bucky Fuller. If you do not remember the work of Bucky Fuller and his geodesic <laughs> geometry, please look him up tonight when you get home and turn in your papers to me tomorrow by 11 a.m. class. But wait a minute, you're actually on vacation, I forgot. Scratch that last assignment. You don't have to write me a Bucky Fuller paper. Instead, everyone should go to Netflix, watch the documentary on my favorite London architecture, Norman Foster, called How Much Does Your Building Weigh Mr. Foster? A question Bucky asked Norman 40 years ago to get him onto the idea of doing more with less materials. And yes, he didn't use very many materials for Norman Foster, subject to that documentary, architectural firm who did that Apple store we just saw on the tour today. Oh, this is an engineering marvel, yeah. a former it's Chicago work and Jane Center. Yeah. Two 40-star office towers originally housed a 40,000 square foot column free trading floor. Ceiling struck supported by the load-bearing walls on either end, but look what they did to increase office space. The top 34 stories can't lever down, send weight down as well, problem. The towers are too heavy. <laughs> if you leave this building alone, I'll use my arms for illustration. The extra weight in the towers could have done this. Yeah, they would have tilted it in that way. So, Alfred Benesh and company, structural engineering firm, has to stop with the problem. They calculated that they could make one little change. They pulled those four plates.
points out, one eighth of an inch from ground to midpoint, and then reverse the process. They bowed the tower slightly out, thus force of weight bears down, but because of the alteration, the building simply shifts back into a straight line. So instead of the whole tower tilting in, it just works on the bow, absolutely plumbed in it. <laughs> Notice the rolled film truss, another form of cantilever on top of the Moyne building. Ralph Johnson left it exposed to visual rhyme with all the bridges over the river. Remember, this is an air rights building. All these buildings are built over the railroad tracks. So the western corner, you have 12 floors hanging over the tracks, but it is the switching yard where all the trains come together. You can't put caissons in the ground without being in the way of the train. So if you cannot support your weight from the ground up, what is your alternative? You lift it from the ceiling down. This handling, see how far back it goes? It is a projecting beam. Think of it like a giant arm, anchored on our end. It holds up the weight of those 12 floors, and that way the train can sneak right into that one. Would everyone use the hashtag shoreline smiles and take a picture of the general growth building it stopped growing? This post-World War II design was inspired by the long, low river barges would still look, uh, work the river. It is a relic in its style, last of its kind downtown. I'm going to miss it. They're going to tear it down and replace it with an 825 foot skyscraper. Ah, but there will be a saving grace because we are embracing the river today. When they put up the new building, you'll open up about 2,000 feet of public parkland and walkway on this side. We come back to the 150 North Riverside building. Did you check out the important fins? Look at the little fins that come off the side of the glass curtain wall. It animates the building. It gives you the illusion that the side of the building is rippling water like the river. So you see you have the actual river here, and then in a sense, a ghost image of the river is the side of the building as well. Look at the top of the cantilever. There's our boat. You'll see the top of our boat coming at us right there. A little bit of our reflection. Now, when they did the wind test on this particular building, I was talking about sway with the Sears Tower. This building's going to sway a lot. And if you don't control that drift of your building, you know what happens. You will get seasick the same way as if you're on the ocean. They're using attuned mass dampeners. This is a fancy way to say water tanks. They install 12 water tanks, two big concrete blocks of six each, holding 160,000 gallons of water. That's about a counterbalance. And the water tanks aren't sliding rails. So it is attuned. Say the building wants to drift this way. Then those water tanks slide the other way and it stabilizes the building. On our right, we re enter the main stem to quite a striking building. The building in the middle is 333 West Wacker Drive, Cone, Pedersen, and Fox. Same firm that did that White Castle building. 1983, cornerstone that revitalized downtown Chicago. It also was Ferris Bueller's dad's place of business. If you ever saw the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Now, it has been called our first postmodern building, and I think it shows something about the postmodernists. Unlike the modernists, where a rose is a rose is a rose, a box is a box is a box, the modernists might just put a box just anywhere. The postmodernists wanted to blend in. So look how everything about this building is about the river. The arc mimics have been we take with the boat, the glass reflects architecture and skyline. Look even at the support columns. Black granite, green marble, look very close. They are not round but octagonal. This is a reference across time, because if you look to your left, look at the corners of the merchandise mark. You see what's going on here? They are also octagonal. This is a conscious time to history. Hmm. When they did that building in the 80s, they wanted to be part of Chicago's architectural conversation across time. How can buildings have a conversation if you can give them a common language? What is the language of buildings? How do they tell each other secrets? through the use of their elements of design. Isn't that a simple gesture? But by making those columns octagonal in 1983, they speak directly now to the corners of 1930 right here. And if you go shopping at the Mart, and there are retail stores for us on floors one and two, the floors are made of black granite and green marble, the same materials they chose for the columns later on. Hey, a quick shout out just to the statues, the heads along the bank of the Mart, which David the Letterman head? called the Pez Hall of Fame. These are not Pez Head giant candy dispensers, although I am writing the Pez Candy <laughs> Company and offering to do an educational set. They're Merchant Princes of early Chicago that Joe Kennedy added. If you'd like to know the Merchant Princes that made the wall, I am always available for you on the dock between tours and I'll show you in a minute. 
Right now, we see Wacker Drive on the right of the world's first bilateral roadway. Burton conceived it in the plan of 1909. His co-author Edward Bennett and Charles Wacker completed it in 1926. The upper level takes you through the city with a four-lane work road underneath all your physical plant needs. Now, Wacker Drive is transforming before your very eyes. The river walk idea can go all the way back to Daniel Burnham, the man with the plan, 1909. Burnham was a student of history who watched the great cities around the globe rise up along rivers because the river always been industry and money. Over time, he noticed how industry on the water would often transfer to land, and you watch a river go from industrial to recreation. Burnham realized this was our destiny, leaving the plan for us to bring to fruition. We're not done yet, but we have put $100 million into the river wall in the last two years alone. And this is Burnham's idea made now. Ah, the LaSalle Walker Building, Whole River Route. Notice that is Art Deco, and that same throne chair look as the Civic Opera Building. Art Deco often looks like an armchair because of the canyon effect. When they first started building skyscrapers, tall buildings blocked the fresh air and sunlight, creating a germ incubator. You could hardly breathe down here. So they wrote an ordinance in 1922-23, and that said your building site, one-fourth of it could be higher than 260 feet, but the other three-quarters of the property, you had to come below there, just so fresh air would pick it all the way down. 77 was Wacker Drive, a great example of postmodernism from Spanish architect Ricardo Bofil of taller architecture. Bofil of modern classicists, look at that, a Greek temple-style roof meets the glass curtain wall of modernism. One word for the squat building next door, 55 was Wacker Drive. Its style is known as brutalism. From the French, beton brut or raw concrete. The brutalists were like modernists who had taken steroids. <laughs> They celebrate structure like all good modernists. They just go a little over the top. What were they doing with those really ponderous heavy beams? They were evoking a sense of timelessness. So you find brutalist architecture very popular in civic buildings and universities especially, right? Because they want that idea of eternal wisdom. 35 West Wacker Drive with a checkerboard finish is home to our largest advertising firm, the Leo Burnett Company. Irish architect Kevin Roche with his postmodern building nods to Chicago School. He's remembering Lewis Sullivan saying a building should be like a Greek column, base shaft capital. Frank Lloyd Wright fans, there is a prairie school reference in the top. Look at the overhanging eaves, take the top of that building down, give it a green lawn, it would fit in with our flat, flat Midwestern landscape like a Frank Lloyd Wright residential house. The potential of the river walk is fully realized with this park. Or it is our Illinois and Vietnam War veterans memorial and wall. It has become a favorite of Chicagoans. That tall white tube in the background is the Aon Center, which at 1136 feet is the third tallest building in Chicago. With diamond roof and spire in front of it, two Prudential Plaza, postmodern art deco, little New York's Chrysler building influence. Mm -hmm. Now come forward. Can everyone see that dark green art deco building with the 50 foot yeah. gold cap? Oh. Looks like a giant bottle of champagne. No? <laughs> this is the Hard Rock Hotel. The champagne design may have been intentional because it actually dates back to Prohibition, the 1920s, when you couldn't be drinking a bottle of champagne. <laughs> it was designed for Union Carbide by the Burnham brothers, Dan Jr. and Hugh Burnham. Many people think that champagne design was an editorial comment on the Prohibition era. That is now becoming a boutique hotel to be named St. Jane. And I think that is a wonderful idea because it is to honor Jane Adams, who was the first social worker in the city of Chicago in the meat pack packing days, famous for her community center known as Whole House. We come back to the Wrigley Building coming up on our left, and you'll see that's one of the many early 1920s buildings, like that jeweler's building, like the Hard Rock Hotel that's clad in the terracotta. Terracotta was very popular after the great Chicago fire. It does look great. Color it, glaze it. It's fireproof. That's your function. Now, artistically, Charles Beersman used the terracotta like the palette of a painter. He has the terracotta tiles not uniform, but they are baked in six different colors, blue white to a creamier white, and suddenly the building is more interesting to the eye because of the diversity of color. In the background, almost mosque like you'll see more of Showa Dome. That is the Hotel Intercontinental, 1930. It began its life as the Medina Athletic Club, a project of the Sons of the East, the Medina Shriners. You know what they were going to do with that dome originally? It was supposed to be a landing pad for airships, blimps, zeppelins. But that uh. steampunk dream would die with the Hindenburg in 1937. Yes, my friends, the dirigible fell out of it. Now, above Sir Norman's new Apple store, which has a roof, which you both smoke the prairie school and an Apple laptop computer, Tribune Tower, home to the Chicago Tribune newspaper. <laughs> 1922. Colonel Robert McCormick, publisher of the Chicago 
Chicago Tribune offered $100,000, a worldwide design contest for the most beautiful office building in the world. 264 entries came in from around the globe. Howells and Hood of New York City won, inspired by the great Gothic cathedrals of France and Belgium in that design. Now, if you're a fan of Joan of Arc, and I mean, who isn't? It was the butter tower of the Rhone Cathedral that Joan of Arc is associated with, and it was their model. NBC Tower coming up on your left is by Adrian Smith, our yeah, architect yeah, yeah. went on to do the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Postmodern Art Deco harked back to the Art Deco of the 1930s. Now you're going to see an antenna building on our left, a glimpse of the John Hancock Center. We'll see it momentarily in the background here. It is 1127 feet, 100 stories in Chicago style. We're bold, we're beautiful, we celebrate structure. Here it comes. This was the first of Chicago's giants. A visit to Chicago should include a visit to the John Hancock Center. Right there it is with its trust tube support system running up on the outside. Mm -hmm. A great walking tour is to start at the Wrigley Building and walk the magnificent mile to north, end up at the John Hancock Center. This is the same team. Bruce Graham, an architect, the architect and engineer, Dr. Fosler Khan, that's the same team that did the Sears Tower. Their Sears Tower might be taller, but their John Hancock Center is their true work of art. Upon arrival, do nothing for 30 seconds. Gaze upon it. I guarantee you will begin to feel as if you are flying, even with your feet on the ground. Then, take the elevator up to the 94th floor. There is a new feature called Chicago 360. It's a glass box with eight windows. You get in, they start a motor, and they tilt you 30 degrees into the air. No one knows why. Finally, visit the 95th floor restaurant lounge, family friendly, it's called the Signature Room, where the best view of the lakefront is a floor to ceiling window inside the ladies' bathroom. Don't ask me how I know, trust me, this is absolutely true. Ah, uh, the Sheraton Hotel and Tower Cornwall Solid Events, 1992. References to Chicago school style, the 1800s. As a matter of fact, if you scroll down State Street, that great street, at State and Madison, you'll find Sullivan Center. You'll know it because it happens around the corner. It's by Lewis Sullivan, father of Chicago School, who built in grace in his later years. So I don't have Sullivan architecture on the river, but I encourage you to seek it out on your own. You can do that by walking down to State and Madison. You can also find the Sullivan Arch that they kept from the Stock Exchange at the Art Institute of Chicago. Stretching out in front of us, you will see the Ferris wheel at Navy Pier. Navy Pier. Navy Pier was an arcade and freight pier in 1916. It was indeed part of Burnham's plan. World War II Naval Training Base. 1,500 Navy pilots trained there. George Bush Sr., one of them, former president. And there are still 200 planes at the bottom of Lake Michigan. Now, the pier has had many lifetimes. It was a college campus from 46 to 1965 for the University of Illinois at Chicago. By the 1990s, the pier was showing signs of dilapidation. It closed down. The Metropolitan Pier Authority was formed, and that's when it was reborn as the visit visitors uh, for both Chicago and visitors like one of the most popular destinations in Chicago today. Now, just east of Lakeshore Drive, the only skyscraper east of Lakeshore Drive is the Tri-Wing Golf Blast Lake Point Tower Condominiums, or as so many 10-year-olds on the boat have told me this summer, I should call it the Fidget Spinner. <laughs> I didn't even know what that toy called a fidget spinner was, now I understand. <laughs> Lake Point Towers architects, Shipwright and Heinrich, 1968, former students of Mies van der Rohe. They were inspired by Glass Skyscraper, which was a visionary sketch Mies had done in Berlin in the 20s. Optimum lakefront views with a glass curtain wall. Optimum privacy retained with a curvilinear design, indeed the first curvilinear skyscraper. By doing three wings with that amount of glass, you keep it separate and the shallowness of the curve in between keeps you looking out at landscape, not into another part of the building. The circle at the very top is a high-end French dining experience called Cité. The views are spectacular. Finally, friends, we are separated from the lake by a concrete retaining wall. These are the Chicago locks. His name implies they are locking in or holding in fresh water. The locks were put in in 1938 when every great lake state had Canada sued Chicago for reversing the river and possibly lying the Great Lakes a bit of the fresh water of this entire planet to drain and fender to the Gulf. The court gave us a number of barrels per day to what could escape. It was 
a problem, so we fixed it because we're Chicagoans, that's what we do. And never was that Chicago attitude more of it than my friends in the day after the great Chicago fire, which mythopoetically speaking uh, still determines our character today. Imagine the day after the fire with maybe only 14 buildings left out of thousands, and the builders are standing in the corner of Chicago and Michigan Avenue. When you go there today, your visitor center is a little yellow castle over the water tower, which said no to the great Chicago fire. It's still standing today. That was the building that gave us the hope to say we will rebuild this city. Why the unofficial motto for Chicago has always been I will. The builders did rebuild Chicago. They were still burning their feet, picked up the trash, carried it down here, threw it in the water, and the trash expanded the shoreline. From Lake Point Tower stands on debris from the fire of 1871. The builders seem to know that like the mythical phoenix, the city of Chicago would rise from its own ashes. That's the city surrounding us today. To conclude our cruise, thank you all for coming out. My name is Kevin, your guy. Now I will be waiting for you all at the top of the ramp as you disembark to take questions and say goodbye. And right now, please everyone just take a seat. You must be seated for parking for safety. And we'll end the tour with one final note. The Chicago and Architectural Gym is also a good so you can amuse them style, the Chicago Blues. So I end my tour with a little blues today, Big Walter Horton's Easy Boogie. Oh. Happy holidays, have a great time.